This is what peak performance looks like, at least for Rocket League bots. Whether it's general neglect, lack of interest, or just technical difficulties, they haven't really improved, and over the years, they have been wreaking havoc among players. They ram into their own teammates, they deliberately score home goals, and if you ask a goal player, they are the sole reason they can't get to champ. Someone desperately needs to stop this madness. It's time to give the bots an upgrade. Now, I'm not the first person who has thought of this idea. There are many talented people in the Rocket League community that have already made custom bots, and I'd like to thank them. Without their extensive knowledge, this video wouldn't have been possible. So, thank you. Now, if we're going to code an upgraded bot, we should start with the first thing the players do, which is the kickoff. There are two main factors to a good kickoff, speed and coverage. It's important to get to the ball as fast as possible to make first contact, since this allows the player to exert greater control over where it goes. But a fast kickoff isn't necessarily a good one. Making good contact is just as important as making first contact. Failure to do this properly is a great way to get yelled at by your teammates. It's for this reason that all of our kickoffs will aim for the center of the ball, where the momentum will transfer the greatest. Let's take a look at the specifics. If we examine the starting positions, we can see that there are three different kickoffs to perform. The back, the offset, and the diagonal. Since our bot is exclusively playing 3v3s, it will need to decide on the fly which bot will contest, while the others do more productive tasks. This can be done by checking the distance from each car to the ball, and choosing the closest one. But the question still remains, how do these bots actually perform the kickoff? We can implement each kickoff by writing instructions depending on how close we get to the ball. This creates a rigid plan to follow, while also adding some leniency should something go wrong. For our back kickoff, we start by accelerating towards the ball. This is followed by a front flip to gain more speed, and then one final jump. For our offset kickoff, we steer towards this boost pad, then flip towards the ball. While slightly slower than a direct approach, this allows the ball to be contested down the middle of the field. And finally, for the diagonal kickoff, I have something special. There is an advanced technique that was popularized by a player called Misty. Muxy? Mankey? Something like that. Anyway, this technique is called a speed flip and it's quite a nuanced manoeuvre, but the general idea is to use a diagonal flip and then cancel its angular momentum. This allows the player to boost towards the target while the flip is still active, which makes it slightly faster. By combining these kickoffs together, the bot can now contest the ball adequately in any starting position. Despite this improvement, however, something is holding them back. Hmm, not sure what it is. Let's look into other aspects of the game and see if we're missing anything. Pop quiz, what is the most important skill in Rocket League? The answer is ball prediction. It's often overlooked, but predicting the ball is a fundamental part of the game. The ability to do it well is also rewarding, as it provides a springboard for a variety of other skills. So if we want good bots, then predicting the ball is a must. Humans are able to predict the ball instinctively, but bots do not possess instincts. What they need is something more explicit. Using the RLBot interface, we can look into the game and find out information about the ball, such as its position and velocity. Unfortunately, we can't look at the code that governs how the ball moves, so what we will do instead is simulate the ball externally using our own code. But to do that, we need to find out everything we can about this thing. Let's start with the size. This is an easy one. When lying on the ground, the center of the ball is 91.25 units high. We know that every point on a sphere is the same distance from its center. Therefore, the height of the center must also be its radius. So the radius of the ball must be 91.25 units. Next, we can look at gravity. Let's drop the ball for a moment. During its brief fall, it traveled 35 units and gained about 211 units of speed. If we examine the difference between two frames of the ball, we can see that the change in speed, or gravity, is roughly 5.4 units. There are 120 frames in each second of Rocket League, which means that the actual value, which is measured in a full second, is 120 times bigger. This brings gravity to 650 units per second. Per second. How bouncy is it? Let's drop the ball again, and let it fall further this time. By analysing the frames again, we find that the ball retains 60% of its momentum after the bounce. This number, 60%, is actually an interesting constant. 
No matter how the ball bounces, it will always retain 60% of the momentum it had in the direction of the wall. This percentage we have found is actually the coefficient of restitution, which basically describes how bouncy an object is, and it's the only thing we need to determine how the ball will react to a wall. So far we have found the radius, the gravity, and the bounciness of the ball, but there is still one thing missing. Remember how I said the ball retains 60% of its momentum? Well I lied. It turns out, balls spin, and when they bounce with spin, this happens. Despite the fact they had no horizontal momentum, the ball still rolled away. This happened because of friction. Friction works against the relative movement between surfaces. This can come from linear movement, but it can also come from spin. This is why our ball bounced to the right, because friction removed some of the relative movement it had between it and the floor. After the initial bounce, the ball lost 28.5% of its total momentum. This value is our coefficient of friction, or grippiness for short, which is sometimes drawn with this funny symbol. Rocket League takes this a step further by reducing the friction applied to the ball when it comes in at a shallow angle. But besides that, that's really all there is to it. We have now gained enough knowledge about the ball to simulate it outside of Rocket League. All we need now is the environment. In video games, complex 3D objects such as the map are usually made of a mesh, which is essentially a large set of triangles. Each triangle forms a surface, and by stitching them together, we can form complex geometry. The ball will strike these triangles as it bounces around the map, so all we need to do is figure out when the ball hits one of these triangles and get it to bounce away. Let's write some code for this. Fucking With this collision system, we can now predict the ball's future, several seconds in advance. Admittedly, you can't predict what some players are going to do with the ball, but honestly, who can? Predictions are only as good as what you can get from them, so if we want to unlock our bot's full potential, we better have a plan on how to capitalise. To strike the ball, we need to drive our car into it, and we can accomplish that by planning out a path to follow. If we are able to obtain an accurate simulation of the car, we could figure out how long it would take to reach any point on the map, then we could compare this to our ball simulation and plan an intersection point that our bot could drive to in real time. Let's start with the throttle. The car accelerates harder first, but as it gains speed, it begins to lose power. The faster you go, the less throttle matters. Eventually, when you reach 1410 units per second, or about 61% of the car's max speed, the throttle no longer applies any acceleration. Alright, stop. Apparently, Rocket League cars have extremely good brakes. Our car experienced 3500 units of acceleration backwards. This is also constant, so it doesn't depend on speed. Let's try activating the boost. Boost adds 991 units of acceleration to the car, while also forcing the throttle to max. This enables the car to push past its initial speed limit, allowing it to reach a new top speed of 2300 units per second. Boost itself is drained quite quickly. Even at 100 boost, it can be drained in 3 seconds, so it's not worth much, and I highly encourage you to steal it from your teammates. So far we've discussed what happens if we accelerate or brake, but what happens if we decide to turn? There's a certain amount of space required to make a turn, independent of speed, and this distance is called the turning radius. Normally, this number would remain static, but Rocket League actually changes how hard your wheels turn at different speeds. This isn't exactly realistic, but it's understandable. Could you imagine rushing down the field at full speed and then turning like this? This change to natural steering means that the car is going to have a different turning radius at every speed. The car turns very tightly when it is slow, but as it speeds up, it becomes very loose and requires a large amount of space to make the same turn. This is a large contributor to how good the car feels, or how bad the developer feels trying to reverse engineer it. Nevertheless, this is actually the last thing we need to know about the car, and we can finally use this system to plan ball strikes. Let's take the kickoffs, the striking system, and a very simple strategy, and combine them to make our very first functioning bot. It's now time to test our bot's might in a 3v3 against the All-Stars. The game starts with a bang. Fury, Iceman, and Dude get back into position, but are quickly interrupted by B2 Bot the Third, who mistakes the goal for the corner of the map and sends the ball flying into the midfield. Fury and Dude pursue, but are ultimately beaten by B2 Bot the Second, who is keenly aware of where the goal is and places the ball right into the middle of the net. 1 0 to Team B2. The second kickoff 
begins. The ball goes flying, and chaos ensues. This allows B2 the third to come in, and once again show off his masterful corner shot. The All-Stars recover from this brutality, and bring it upfield, but now it's B2 the first's turn to strike. Once again, Team B2 places the ball right down the middle, and forces Fury to hurry back to the goals for a save. Fury then attempts to keep the momentum going, but the ball is promptly stolen from him. Dude has been impressed by the B2 bots striking, and decides to give them another chance. This immediately leads to another pinpoint goal. 2-0 to Team B2. Things continue to go badly for Team All-Star, as they let in shot, after shot, after shot, after shot. It's now 6-0, and oh it appears we have a pitch invader! Security at these big events has been pretty lackluster recently, but it looks like they're about to be taken care of, and there you go. The pitch invader appears to have distracted Team B2, as they drop their first point to the All-Stars. The score is now 6-1. Okay, I think we all know where this is going, but bear with me. The 8th kickoff begins. The ball is sent high, but Dude is patient and avoids pressure as he goes on the offensive. But B2 the first has other plans, and rushes out to pinch the ball off the wall, sending both teams into disarray. This results in a 50-50, which goes horribly for Team All-Star, and for more reasons than the position. This is not a goal you want to let in. But the pressure gets to Fury, who bumps into his own goalie, and what follows is a complete implosion of the defense, which allows that seventh goal to roll in. Let me rename this guy quick. Embarrassed by his failure, Fury decides to take matters into his own hands, and takes the Brazil away just as quickly as it appeared. The... This is boring! They don't even fly! They can't even aerial! They can't even... Alright Captain Blubber, have it your way. So, we're in the air now, but how do we get to the ball? Our car has essentially turned into a spaceship with a really weak rocket. It now has the ability to rotate freely in midair, as well as apply thrust to keep it airborne. Compared to our grounded state, the car's boost functions a little bit differently. Instead of accelerating along the ground, boost now accelerates the car in the direction of the nose. Boost also gets slightly more powerful in midair as well. Instead of the usual 991 units, we now experience 1058 units of acceleration. This is good to know, but it's actually the least of our worries here. The real trouble is getting the car to face the right way. There are three ways to rotate the car. We can yaw, we can pitch, and we can roll. You can imagine these rotations as sticking a skewer through the car's centre and twisting it. Yaw correlates to the up skewer, while pitch correlates to the right skewer, and roll to the forward skewer. In the game, we can use our controls to rotate around any of these axes, but the important part is that we can combine these rotations together. This allows us to spin the car in any way we want. The only thing we need to look out for is the differing rotation rates on each axis. Rocket League cars roll much faster than they pitch or yaw, so we will have to adjust our inputs accordingly in order to make them all have the same effect. We now have control over the spin of our car, but what about pointing it in a certain way? Let's say we are pointing this way, and we want to point this way. We can take these two directions and perform an operation known as the cross product. This gives us a new axis, which we can now use to rotate between the two originals. But it's not quite that simple. What we are actually doing here is applying acceleration. We cannot stop the car from turning instantly, meaning we can overshoot our target. Or worse, unwanted spin will make it impossible to actually reach the target. To solve these issues, we are going to use a PID controller. PID controllers attempt to assign position through acceleration, and their main feature is fighting unwanted adjustments while also reaching a target. This means it'll deal with overshoot and unwanted spin really well. If we pair this with our cross product, we now have a way of rotating the car in any direction we want, very quickly. Now, we can finally apply this to an aerial. Thanks to our ball prediction, we know where the ball is going to be, and exactly when it will be there. We also know our car's position, velocity, and gravity. We can put all this information into an equation, and use it to find out acceleration. Acceleration represents the direction we need to boost in, as well as how hard we need to boost. The strength of this acceleration is important. There is a limit to how hard we can propel the car. If the acceleration required is stronger, then we simply won't be able to. 
so we should only consider aerials that require weaker acceleration than what our boosts can output. It would also be wise to check how much boost we need. If an aerial requires boosting for more than 3 seconds times the portion you have, then it is no good. All of these factors allow us to quickly pluck candidates from the future of the ball. From there, we can easily use any of these positions, and rotate towards the required direction. Now, we can sit back, relax, and relish the fact that our bot will hit the aerial it's going for. But hitting aerials isn't just about making contact. Performing a good landing is also important. Luckily, we've already built the rotation controller required to do this, but rather than using it for aerials, we can use it to point the roof of the car towards the sky. That way, we can ensure that the car always lands on its wheels. Other than that, I think we've covered almost everything now. Our bot can now perform most of the skills this game has to offer. There's still a ton of room for improvement, but honestly, I think I'll leave that for another time. Oh.